The C's can still finish second, third, or fourth. But the long and short of it is this. They can't finish lower than third if they beat the Grizzlies on Sunday. And by the time they tip off, they'll know what they need to do. Here is Ime Yudoka on how they're going to approach the weekend. As I mentioned, coming into this road trip, three games in 13 days, you got quite a bit of break time there. And so we still want to get them a run and not have a week and a half off with no basketball. Obviously, we can try to emulate some in practice, but that live action is good, but also being cautious. And, you know, we're still playing for some seedings and standings. We'll see what Memphis does being set at two already, and you know, we'll determine that over the next two days. All right, let's talk about the Celtics with the stadium's Jeff Goodman, who I understand. I mean, I grew up Catholic, so I understand this confessional type thing people like to do. Is and, it that serious, um, Jeff? You know, I, what would you like to confess, Jeff? I hear there's something you really want to get off your chest. Yeah, it, it's time, Trini. It's time I, I, I admitted, and you know, for my sins, and, and my sins are that I said that they should break up Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown <laughs> oh. a couple months ago, and. I don't think I was the only one. You were not. And listen, at that point in time, as I said, they look like they had never played ball together. And, and since it's amazing what uh, they and Marcus Smart, and you got to give a ton of credit to Ime for, for what he's been able to do. And I almost feel like hitting rock, rock bottom, kind of what Ime needed to get their attention and get them to learn how to play together, how to move the ball, how to be unselfish. And again, listen, they never had any leaders to look up to. That was the difficult part of Tatum and Jalen Brown. Who are they looking at younger? I mean, Kyrie? I don't have anybody. I mean, in your defense, though, Jeff, a couple of months ago, I don't know if Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown knew if they wanted to play together. They'd have a, they'd have a conversation about They had a it. conversation. They actually discussed it. It's like, what do you think? Well, what do you think? I don't think we can do it. I think we can do it. So I don't think it's that outrageous, but... I do think that whatever they've done, and whether it's Ime or whether it's those two guys deciding to come together and figure this out, and maybe with some altered playing, some altered sensibilities from Marcus Smart, they figured out a way to not just win games, but to dominate teams and put themselves in a position to now we're, we're sitting back thinking like, oh, who do we want in the playoffs? Who would be good for the Celtics? The, right. the approach that they've taken, um, you know, from top to bottom, coaching players, everything, it, they deserve a lot of credit for it. Seven Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers. <laughs> should, should take care of it all. Uh, I feel and, and better. Make everything, I feel and make better. everything right. That's what you do. You just say you're sorry. Uh, but how about last night, Goodman? I, I am in, I think I'm alone on an island, uh, at least on this show. I didn't love not going for it against the Bucks last night. To me, if you have a chance at the number two seed, if you have the chance to impart your will on them, you go for it. But you, did you like what the Celtics did last night in resting Al Horford? I'm just going to call it what it is, resting Al Horford and Jason Tatum. Well, I, I don't mind resting Al Horford. He's in his late 30s. Jason Tatum, I, I'm not sure about. Listen, the bottom line is, you want to somehow get Cleveland or Chicago in the, in the first round. So whatever you can do to get them, that's kind of what you want at this point. I, I, I want Cleveland more than anybody, but I'll take Chicago because Chicago hasn't played great. They've had numerous injuries. They're not getting Lonzo Ball back. So I think they're a completely different team without Lonzo Ball. So to me, whatever you have to do to try to get Cleveland or Chicago, I'm all for it. Abso right. Absolutely. I mean, that path of least resistance. Well, Trenny, what are you one of these people? Give me the toughest challenge. I want to win every game. The regular yeah. season, for the most part, it's over. Okay? Time now, life hard. Now, 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 trials of life. Wasn't that a time life series with a killer whale eating the seal? No. What you're talking about now is positioning yourself for the best success in the postseason. And part of that positioning means you don't go all out to try and beat the Bucks if it's going to screw up the seating and you don't end up getting Chicago in the first round. Okay, but this is also a team, though, who has been talking about how good they are and how they're one of the best teams in the NBA. They still are good. How they good. can beat anyone. And to me... They can. If they, okay, if you can, then just play whoever is in front of you. And I just... I always worry about people, teams trying to dial something back and trying to... Because there is still a chance, as we just read in that... A Goodman, as I just pointed out in that full screen... They could still be the number two seed. Like, Milwaukee could go out and decide, I don't want to play Brooklyn. So they could stumble against Detroit and then not win against Cleveland, and then you're the number two seed anyway, no matter what you did. I'd rather just be in the mindset, that killer mindset. Listen, they're a completely different team without Robert Williams. So whatever we say, 
if they can get a first round win, get it against whoever it is. And then you hope to have a healthy Robert Williams back because frankly, we don't know even if Robert Williams comes back, if we can trust that he's going to stay healthy. So get a first round win over. I don't care who it is. Have the easiest team you can play, whether it's Cleveland, then maybe Chicago. And that's not going to be easy. I mean, DeMar DeRozan still has had a hell of a year. Zach Levine's healthy. Vucevic terrific. So they've got enough there to compete with the Celtics team that doesn't have, or probably won't have a healthy Robert Williams in the lineup. So to me, get through the first round and hope you have a uh, big Rob back. Well, speaking of Robert Williams, here's Ime Udoka, I believe on your very program this oh. morning, talking about how he's doing. You know, I try to give my perspective of somebody who's had five surgeries, including two ACLs. I was like, a meniscus is nothing when you have when you had to go through ACL surgery. So uh, I gave him my viewpoint on it. But um, for him to go through it and come out the way he has, uh, already get jumping into his two days to try to you know expedite the process of recovery and attacking his rehab. He's in the good, the right mind frame, and just being around the guys is great. So. Um, the, the doctor said it went as well as it could go, and so we're looking forward to getting it back at some point. All right, Jeff, you heard him right there. Ime Udoka saying, hey, I've had ACLs and MCL. That's not our meniscus. That's, <laughs> That's not a big deal at all. He's doing two days. What are you hearing, Jeff Goodman, about the health and progress of Robert Williams? Email also wasn't making what uh, Robert was making. So he had to come back a little bit quicker to earn his paycheck and stay in the league. Um, Rob's making quite a bit of money and, and, and it's not as much pressure. And he's also, again, he's young guys obviously are told these days, don't come back too quick. It's a different world right now. They don't want to, they don't want to hurt themselves in terms of down the road, their future earnings. Uh, Rob's been hurt quite a bit. I, I think, again, a realistic expectation is for him to be back full for the second round if they get that far. Maybe he comes back at some point in the first round. But, again, how healthy is he going to be? This is a guy that you've got to be careful with because of, obviously, his past injury issues. So, again, I'm not sure if I believe that he's going to be back in this first round. Jeff, you said they're a completely different team without Robert Williams. I think they're different, but I also think if they're as good as we've been led to believe they are by them, that they should be able to overcome at least for a round and maybe even more his absence. Now, I know everyone ramps it up defensively in the postseason, and Robert Williams is a huge part of their defense, but if that means some of the other guys have to step up their defense, so be it. If they're that good, the loss of Robert Williams for a series or a series and a half shouldn't derail the entire postseason, at least I don't think. And two, I think. Yeah, but you know what? Go ahead, Jeff. That rim protection. Trying to, he, he gives him that rim protection that Al just doesn't give him. He's got those young legs that honestly can make up for other guys' mistakes on the perimeter, um, all over the court. And on the offensive end, he also gives you kind of a bailout, right? You can just throw it up to Rob and he can go get it. Uh, and get to. So he's just completely different. And again, when I talked to Jason Tatum a month ago, his big thing, and I asked him this, I said, why? Why have you guys been able to kind of flip the switch, switch here? And, and he said, we're whole. And that's the biggest thing with this team, almost the belief now when they have everybody intact that they can beat anybody in the league. Yeah, well, they are going to have to move forward, at least for the short-term foreseeable future without Robert Williams. So how about some guys that are going to fill in for him? Let's start with Daniel Tice. Uh, Tice played a season-high 41 minutes last week when the Seas sat four starters against the Raptors. He scored a season-high 22 points last night against the Bucks, which makes us wonder, is Tice now safely in? We're calling this the trust tree segment. Oh. Who is in the trust tree? Jeff Goodman and Hardy uh, is Daniel Tice, and we'll start with Goodman. Is he now in the Celtics trust tree where you can trust him to do what he needs to do until Robert Williams gets back and be a contributor? I mean, he was always in, in the trust tree for me as a rotation big, right? Like plays hard, gives the effort, will fight you, will run the court. He just, again, he can't do the same things that Robert Williams can do no matter what. He's just... Athletically, very few can do the same things that Robert Williams can do. So, uh, again, can Tice fill in a game here or a game there? Yes. But consistently, again, he can't block and alter shots 
That's the difference with, with Robert Williams around the basket. He's just an intimidating factor where everybody on the opposition has to know where Robert Williams is. Uh, I'm with you 100%, Jeff. It's the, it's the shot blocking that is uh, the element that is missing from Tice's game as compared to Robert Williams. So I trust him to the extent that he, could, that he can do what I already think he can do, but not to do more. To, to, to quote the Jim Blossoms, if I don't expect too much from him, I may not be let down. So I, I'm not... I love the Jim Blossoms. Yeah, that's a great... Love them. New Miserable Experience, underrated album. Well, I guess suppose if you can't stop teams like you have been and you're maybe not as good defensively, maybe you get a little offensive boost off the bench. How about Peyton Pritchard getting lots of crunch time minutes both uh, last week against the Raptors and last night against the Bucks? Pritchard actually played nearly half of his minutes last night in the fourth quarter, scoring seven of his 12 points in the final frame. So has Hardy uh, Peyton Pritchard worked his way into the trust tree. I, I tell you what he has, and it's not for his offense, it's for his defense. I've seen some late-game defense from Peyton Pritchard that was out of this world. A guy out there trying to prove that, like, not only can I contribute to this team and I can go out there and make some shots, but defensively I can be something that you can really rely on late in the game if you need to call on me or if it's just late at the end of the first quarter, if it's the beginning of the second, late at the end of the third, beginning of the fourth, put me in. Uh, I'm not going to have a, a nasty plus minus because I'm going to go out there and play defense and in addition maybe put some points on the board for you too. So for me, he's in the trust tree. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, Pritchard's a good backup point guard. You know, I worry a little bit against the Bulls. He's going to go up against athletic dudes. Io DeSumo, Colby White if they have to play uh, Chicago. But, you know, Pritchard's a guy that obviously can knock down shots. Uh, knows his role, can move the basketball, and defensively, while he's giving away some athleticism, some size, uh, he still fights you. So, I, again, I like guys that, that can accept their roles and thrive in their roles, and that's what I think we're looking at with Daniel Tice and Peyton Pritchard and the guy we're going to get to next. Ah, uh -huh. look at that. You run the rundown. Derek White is the guy that Goodman is talking to. He's taking a much more prominent role in the offense. Last week against Toronto and last night against Milwaukee, the initial to logging some big minutes. White also seems to be finding his groove beyond the arc in those two games. He's a combined 7 of 16 from three-point range. What do you like about this guy? You just said, hey, I, I add this guy to that trust tree list. What do you like about him, Goodman? I, I love him. I, I seriously love Derek White. I'm the biggest Derek White fan there is because <laughs> He just knows how to play the damn game. Like, he plays it the right way. He moves the basketball. He is a high IQ player. From the moment they got him, I, I thought it was such a great move for Brad Stevens. And I was shaking my head at why San Antonio would move him because it was still a pretty friendly contract um, for a guy in his prime. But, again, Derek White's a team guy. He's not going to take bad shots. He's not going to force uh, things when he shouldn't. And he's always going to be in the right position defensively. So I love, I completely trust Derek White. I really like him too. And the getting to know you phase was very short, and uh, he's proven himself in a in a short period of time. Here's the thing, guys. So what we've all talked about most of this season, besides breaking up Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and trading one of them away, is that this team has to rely so heavily on it. it's really like seven or eight guys because their bench is just not very strong. Do you now feel differently, Hardy, about this bench? Like after you've seen them get some crucial minutes uh, in games what, when they are resting players or guys need to take a night off, do you feel better about this bench going forward? Yeah, and I didn't really feel bad about them in the first place. So to say I feel better about them indicates that I thought it was a real weakness before. Look, Look, there are a lot of weaknesses on this team. There are weaknesses in your starting five at the beginning of the season. So the bench wasn't that much of a concern. But early on, I saw enough from some of these guys to think, all right, they've got something that is more than just fill-in time. There are guys who can go in there and hold court, and they can actually – uh, you know, put some pressure on some starters if they're left in on the opposition. So um, is it is it a full blown strength? I don't know if I go that far, but I would absolutely say I don't have a concern about the Celtics bench right now. Trenny, the big the biggest thing for me is you've got winning guys coming off the bench, yeah. guys that won in college, guys that, again, are all about high IQ, making the right plays. I thought they got rid of some guys that probably weren't his body in Dennis Schroeder. Romeo Langford was always hurt. I think that's what they did here. You've got four or five guys four coming off the bench that know their role, that play hard, that play the right way, that are all about winning rather than about their own numbers. Yeah, and seem to accept their role, which is sometimes hard to find in pro sports.